各位来宾，总统已经抵达会场。Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Her Excellency President Tsai Ing-wen, TFD Chairman and Speaker of the Legislative Yuan, Mr. Yeo Xiquan, and Taiwan's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Chao Xie Joseph Wu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the opening ceremony of World Movement for Democracy, 11th Global Assembly. To begin with, we would like to invite everyone to take a group photo first to remember this special event in Taipei this year. So please look at the camera at the upper right-hand corner hanging from the ceiling. And please keep your masks on and smile with your eyes. Beautiful. Thank you very much for joining the photo shoot. Today's event will now commence. Let's watch the opening video together. Hi, my name is Gulala Ismail, and I am a human rights activist. The world is at a crossroad, facing an authoritarian future. The number of democracies around the world continues to shrink, and freedom and rule of law are out of reach for more and more people. But the public demand for democracy remains strong. There are bright spots where democracy movements have pushed back and won against the global spread of autocracy. Even in very restrictive places, people continue to organize, to demand freedom, justice, and accountable governance. Today, we want to celebrate our resilience, articulate our visions for the democratic future, and build stronger coalitions to achieve that future. This year's theme for the Global Assembly of the World Movement for Democracy is Claiming the Democratic Future, Unifying Voices for a New Frontier. At this Global Assembly, we will dive into four topics, protecting and expanding civic space, making technology work for democracy, reclaiming fact-based information, and cultivating a next generation of democratic leaders. Since 1999, leaders of the democracy advocacy community have come together at our global assemblies to build solidarity and share new ideas and lessons learned. The global assemblies have served as launching pads for collective efforts to tackle challenges of civic space, foster regional collaborations, and empower emerging democratic leaders. This year's assembly will be equally momentous. We hold this Global Assembly in Taiwan for a number of reasons. Taiwan's success as a vigorous democracy makes it an inspiring example of the ways democratic institutions can create a robust society, celebrating diversity and empowering new generations. But as strong as it is, Taiwan is also an example of why the global community of democracy advocates must support each other in the face of overt authoritarian threats to their freedom. The demand for democracy continues to be strong. We as a community are inspired by the many people who resist the corrupting forces of an unjust few. Let's join together to work towards a future that serves all people. And now, please. And now, please join me in welcoming to the stage Maria Ressa. Chair of the World Movement for Democracy Steering Committee to give us the opening remarks.
oh my God, I'm going to be on tiptoes because I'm always short, you know, so it's always, um, but I guess first of all, thank you for being here, right? This is the time when we say that it is, it's enough to be the punching bag. If many of you are like me over the last few years, that's what we've felt like, right? That we keep trying to do what we used to do as civil society, but it doesn't work anymore and that we must do more. So let me first do the right thing, which is say welcome to the 11th Global Assembly of the World Movement for Democracy. And that this year, this time matters. This is a pivotal moment. Um, you heard from the video the three ways when we go back to what this movement is about. It is a global network of democracy activists, human rights defenders, independent journalists, parliamentarians, and donors to those three things that you heard defend and expand civic space, where we remind our citizens that we are citizens, not consumers or users, to promote inclusive governance and to empower the next generation of leaders. The last time we were all together like this was in 2018 in Dakar, Senegal. The world has drastically changed since then. Um, our incentive structure has fundamentally changed. We know that lies spread at least six times faster than facts over the social media platforms that now connect all of us, which means that if you say a lie a million times, it becomes a fact. And I'm gonna quote the three sentences I've said repeatedly over and over. If you don't have facts, you can't have truth. Facts, truth. If you don't have truth, you can't have trust. If we don't have any of these three, we don't have a shared space, democracy as we know it is dead, and we cannot solve the existential problems we face. So I'll just talk about the impact in the two ways that we have to deal with, which is personally for each of us, right? When social media has been used for information warfare, and the very platforms that connect us to each other, that give us supposed facts, are actually used to insidiously manipulate us. It's become behavior modification system. The three layers it affects us, the personal, each of us on social media, as groups, sociological, and then finally the one we rarely talk about all the way up at scale globally is emergent human behavior. The worst of humanity is what is encouraged by the information ecosystem we now live in. That brings us to something I know you will hear from Ann Applebaum, our keynote speaker today, to this point where we are in the last two minutes in the game of democracy. And I say that if you look, if we have no integrity of facts, then we have no integrity of elections. Now take a look at every single election this year, there are more than 30. Um, we've, we're finishing Brazil now, and then we're moving on to the United States. 2024, Venezuela begins its Nigeria, Turkey, Africa, 2020, sorry, 2023, and then on 2024, the last two minutes, in 2024, what's there? You have India, the world's largest democracy, Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim population, and the United States. If nothing changes drastically in the next two years, there will be more illiberal leaders elected democratically, tipping the balance of power globally from democracy to fascism. So, this is what we're here to address. The assembly is this hugely important opportunity for all of us to unify our efforts and to find collective action, to look at a global movement. And there is no better place to do this than in Taiwan, Madam President. It is where David wins against Goliath, where collective action wins over manipulation. This is what I hope we do. And let me just end with this last part, which is in the Philippines, we had to ask ourselves a question that I hope you ask yourselves today. 
And there are so many activists here who have given up so much. Some of you who can't be named because you are sacrificing so much. The question is, what are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? It is a question Taiwanese know. It is a question those who are fighting for democracy know in their hearts. And if we answer that question today collectively, in the next few days, we'll have done, we'll have moved a step forward in trying to preserve these values and principles. So let me just end with, I'm so looking forward to being with you. I'm going to quote Indonesia. They have this kind of acronym, NATO, and this is what we do not want to do. NATO, like NATO, NATO, no action, talk only, NATO. We will talk and we will act. That's what we hope to do. Now, let me introduce you to Mr. Alvin Chang, representing the Taiwan Association for Democracy. The Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy is one of the five civil society partners that the world movement has worked to make this assembly happen. The Taiwan Youth Association was founded in 2018 to promote the participation of young gen dem uh, generations in democratic politics. We need stronger, more engaged civil society. That group shows us what it has done in Taiwan. The association is the first young organization in Taiwan that emphasizes policy advocacy and youth empowerment. Today, they are driving a powerful campaign advocating a constitutional amendment to lower the voting age from 20 years to 18 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Alvin Chang. Good morning, all the distinguished guests and participants. I'm Elvin Chang, head director of the Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy. On behalf of the association, I'm really grateful for the invitation from the World Movement for Democracy. Along with Taiwanese civil society organizations, including Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, Garden of Hope Foundation, Information Operations Research Group, and Taiwan Tongzhi LGBTQ Plus Hotline Association. I also want to welcome all of you to our beautiful country, Taiwan. Throughout the history of Taiwan democratic movements, the youth generation of the different era always played an integral role in pushing forward the Taiwan democratic progress of Taiwan. For example, almost 100 years ago, in the 1920s, there was a Taiwan petition movement to establish the parliament for Taiwanese people. The youth at that time not only devoted themselves in the movement, they also established the Taiwanese Cultural Association and initiated the Taiwan Cultural Enlightenment Movement. In the 1960s, some young people threw themselves into the Dang Wai Movement, calling for freedom of speech and the lifting for martial law. In the 1980s, the student movements that called for complete freedom of press, the academic independence, and the autonomy of universities. In 1990s, the Wild Lily movement launched by students was aimed to further liberalization and to push Taiwan's democratization progress, the movement that to the complete re-election of the parliament 
the amendment for the constitution. It ultimately led Taiwan to become a truly democratic country. Around 2010, in the face of the threat from China, the youth generation again stood up to bring awareness on disinformation, economic coercion, and investment from China. The 2008 Wild Strawberry Movement, 2012 Anti-Media Monopoly Movement, and most importantly, 2014 Sunflower Movement are all examples of student movement that show the youth certain concern toward the future and the autonomy of Taiwan. This year, 2022, is definitely the year of the youth. Taiwan has, uh, has not amended our constitution for the past 15 years. But this year, on November 26, Taiwan will hold a constitutional referendum to decide whether to lower the voting age from 20 to 18. However, Taiwan has the highest threshold worldwide for passing the constitutional amendment. Therefore, this referendum must be supported by three quarters of the amending legislators in the parliamentary session, and in which at least three quarters of the total legislators are taking part. The amendment was passed. Now, this referendum requires the vote of 50% of voters in a nation referendum for it to come into effect. This means at least 9.6 million voters need to vote yes for the referendum on November 26. I want to emphasize here that the youth generation cares about our constitution, which symbolizes the fundamental value of our own country. The youth generation also cares about whether we can vote when we reach adulthood. We believe that in a democratic country like Taiwan. We are able to vote our legislators, vote for our mayors, vote for our presidents. It is time for us to vote to amend our constitution and to determine the future of Taiwan. Recently, groups of high school students went to the street and to persuade cross-generation voters to vote yes on this referendum. 9.6 million voters cannot be accomplished only by the younger generation. Only with the support from all generations that valued youth empowerment, the referendum should pass. Next month, I hope we in Taiwan can make history that the voters will vote to lower the voting age to 18, so that we, the Taiwanese people, can continue to embrace core values that we believe in, democracy, freedom, and human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much to Chair President Zhang. Please take your seat. Next, we would like to invite Chairman of Taiwan Foundation for Democracy and Speaker of the Legislative Yuan, Mr. Yu Xiquan, to share a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman Yu. Uh, 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 Chairperson Maria Ressa, Chairman Kenneth Wallach, 
President Damon Wilson, Elvin Chang, who just spoke, Minister Joseph Wu, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First of all, I would like to welcome in my capacity as Taiwan Foundation for Democracy Chairperson and Legislative UN Speaker, all of our foreign guests to Taiwan. It is a great honor for Taiwan to host the first in-person global assembly of the World Movement for Democracy since the COVID-19 pandemic abated. Hosting the global assembly of the World M Movement for Democracy in Taipei in 2022 is one of the 62 commitments made earlier this year by Taiwan in response to the Summit for Democracy hosted by United States President Joe Biden. That we are gathering here shows Taiwan is a trustworthy democratic partner for the global community. This year celebrates the 11th Global Assembly of the World Movement for Democracy. More than 200 democracy advocates from around 70 countries have come here to make face-to-face -face communication and exchanges in this historic meeting. This event is another international convention for democracy held in Taiwan following the Open Parliament Forum last December. We as Taiwanese are proud and cheered on by the hosting of these important events. The Global Assembly's theme, claiming the democratic future, unifying voices for a new frontier, has a very special meaning this year. Russia launched military aggression against Ukraine this February exasperating the distress that people around the world have already been suffering from the pandemic and climate change. For the global community of democracy, this war of aggression is a grave warning to all of us, urging us democratic alliance to cooperate and demonstrate solidarity with greater strength. When I met with President Wilson this March, we shared the belief that democracy is our common value that requires our effort in order to achieve democratic consolidation and push back against authoritarianism. Therefore, against this background, I believe there is no other place more suitable than Taiwan to host this year's Global Assembly of the World Movement for Democracy. Taiwan has been the focus of global attention after the outbreak of the Ukraine-Russia war. Like Ukraine, Taiwan is located next to an authoritarian state that, like Russia, has ambitions to expand its territory and lay unfounded claims to its surroundings. What makes it even more dangerous is the fact that authoritarian leaders are very likely to make reckless decisions as they are not circumscribed by the principles of checks and balances that characterize democracy. The Ukrainian people are now bravely standing at the front line of Russian aggression. The alliance of democracies has to unite and act as their powerful backing and show dictatorial and authoritarian regimes that the price for invading liberal democracies is too high for them to bear. The reality of an authoritarian country invading a democratic country has made the alliance of democracies reflect on and recognize the fragility of our beloved democratic institutions and the necessity of pushing back against authoritarian politics. We have come to realize that the threat of authoritarianism is undeniable and that democracy requires defense. Taiwan now stands at the front line of this defense, protecting the democratic way of life. Democracy in Taiwan is the result of a hundred year long struggle. Since the lifting of martial law and democratization in the 1980s, Taiwan has made evident progress in various aspects, such as human rights protection, gender equality, and plurality of civil society. Taiwan has been ranked Asia's number one full democracy, the eighth in the world in the 2021 Democracy Index, a report released by the Economist Intelligence Unit earlier this year. 
Taiwan has also been ranked second in Asia and 17th in the world in the 2022 Freedom in the World report. It shows that Taiwan's endeavor has been recognized by the world. We cherish this way of life and are determined to continue our efforts in advancing human rights and democratic values. Before I conclude, I would like to warmly welcome all of you again to Taiwan, where I'm sure you will be able to exchange ideas and opinions freely, cementing the democratic network of mutual support. I also believe that this task will be easily achieved with the help of Taiwanese food, the country's beautiful scenery, and its friendly people. I wish the conference every success and all of you good health and great happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Yeo. Once again, we would like to thank Chairman Yeo for your encouragement and support. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to give a warm welcome to Her Excellency President Tsai Ing-wen. Thank you. Legislative Yen President Yo, Foreign Minister Wu, WMD Chair Ressa, and TYAD Secretary General Zhang, and NET President and CEO Wilson, distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Great. Let me begin my talk by welcoming you all to Taiwan. You are among the first groups of international friends to visit Taiwan after we lifted our border restrictions. I want to also thank the Taiwanese civil society organizations for joining us today on this special occasion. I want to say that Taiwan is honored to be the place where the World Movement for Democracy convenes its 11th Global Assembly. I want to express my appreciation to the World Movement for Democracy Secretariat, that is the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, and its partner organizations for organizing this impressive event that has gathered hundreds of democracy activists, experts, parliamentarians, and donors from 70 countries worldwide. I especially want to welcome Maria Russia. Last year's Nobel, Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate to Taiwan again, your courage and commitment to media freedom and the freedom of expression inspires us all. Congratulations on your new position as the chairperson of WMD's steering committee, I'm sure your leadership will, will invigorate democracy around the world. I see the next former president, Carl Gershman, is with us here today. It is wonderful to see you again after such a long time. Your staunch support for Taiwan and the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy is something we will always be grateful for. I also see Ness new president, Damon Wilson, here. It is also great to see you again after you brought the wonderful news that the World Movement Steering Committee unanimously chose Taiwan as the location for its assembly. Thank you. I must emphasize that this assembly could not have convened at a more consequential time. At this moment, democracies and rule-based world order, order are facing the greatest challenges since the Cold War. As we work diligently to remedy the impact of the pandemic on global health and economy, we also have to combat authoritarian regimes' attempts to corrode democratic institutions and tarnish human rights and civil and civic space. Russia's unprovoked 
invasion of Ukraine is a prime example. It shows that authoritarian regimes will do whatever it takes to achieve expansionism. The people of Taiwan are all too familiar with such aggression. In recent years, Taiwan has been confronted by increasingly aggressive threats from China, from military intimidation, cyber attacks, and economic coercion to gray zone activities and influence operations. All our attempts to instill fear, create doubts, and obliterate our citizens' confidence about what we have been working so hard for. That is our democratic way of life. However, even under constant threats, the people of Taiwan have never shied away from the challenges of the authoritarian interference. Instead, the Taiwanese met them head on and fought against forces looking to undermine our hard-earned democracy. Now, we're eager to share our story of resilience with you all and learn from your experiences as well. The Taiwanese people fought for decades to bring about the vibrant democracy we enjoy today. In Taiwan, democracy is more than a fundamental value that unites our people. It is also a critical asset in addressing major challenges. Our democratic ideals are at the heart of our effective pandemic response. They informed our continued work to improve government transparency. And they guide us in empowering all of our people to have a stake in our country's future. The driving force behind the development of our democracy is our civil society. It has played an integral role in Taiwan's democratization. Now, it is an active, mobilized, and effective check on government. I believe the involvement of Taiwan's civil society in the governance of our country is unparalleled in the region. Moreover, as we look to the future, we must also ensure that young people are empowered to con contribute to this movement. In Taiwan, we are currently working to empower our younger generation with the right to vote and to make changes at a younger age. I'm happy to see the involvement of the Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy as a partner to this assembly. I'm also happy to learn that prior to the assembly, there was a series of youth consultative meetings that took place in multiple regions of the world, where young democ democracy leaders strategized to make the world they live in a better place. Together with the sessions on youth participation, I'm sure this assembly will help spur awareness and action among the younger generation. As we observed the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Taiwan is proud to play a role in the efforts to assist the Ukrainians in their struggle to defend their country and freedom. We all should continue with our efforts. The challenge posed by authoritarian regimes is an important wake-up call for de Democrats worldwide. While extraordinary challenges remain, we must work together to strengthen our resilience and safeguard our values. More importantly, we can only achieve this by understanding authoritarian tactics. And with this understanding, we can then strategize on how to counter influence exerted by authoritarian regimes. We must also rekindle the democratic alliance to serve the interests of the international community. The World Movement for Democracy's Global Assembly is the perfect occasion for this important work. I want to end my talk by thanking you all again for your physical presence in Taiwan today 
It is a demonstration of your support for Taiwan and its democracy. The people of Taiwan are always grateful and treasure such support. Through gatherings like this, we can reaffirm our solidarity and build our democratic resilience together. Lastly, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate those who are being honored with the Democracy Courage Tributes. Your extraordinary courage in championing for democracy and human rights is an inspiration to us all. I hope that your participation in this assembly helps deepen global democratic ties and spur new ideas for the democratic future. I know there's a culture night later this evening. I hope you enjoy the performances and the discussions. I wish you all a productive assembly and hope you enjoy Taiwan's beautiful scenery, people, and of course, our delicious food. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Tsai. Please join the Prime Thank you very much. 接下来要邀请今天出席的贵宾合影。合影时，请贵宾继续戴上口罩。And now we would like to invite the hosts and guests of honor to the stage for a group photo. Please keep your mask on during the photo shoot. Please welcome WMD Steering Committee members Dismas Kitenge from Democratic Republic of Congo. Simon Penick from the Czech Republic. <clears throat> Ketavan Chachava from Georgia. <clears throat> Tamara Adrian from Venezuela. <clears throat> Glenis Changachiriri from Zimbabwe. Hassa Shire from Somalia. <clears throat> Suk Chong Lee from Korea. <clears throat> Maiko Ichihara from Japan. Tanya Hamada from the Philippines. Damon Wilson, President of National Endowment for Democracy. Alvin Zhang, Chairperson of Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy. Mr. Ken Wallach, Chairman of National Endowment for Democracy. <laughs> WMD Chair Maria Ressa. <laughs> and please welcome Foreign Minister Dr. Zhao Xie Joseph Wu, TFD Chairman Mr. Yao Xiquen, and Her Excellency President Tsai Ing-wen. Ladies and gentlemen, please look at the camera in the center together. Thank you very much for joining the photo shoot. Thank you. Please remain on the stage for now.
Ladies and gentlemen, President Tsai and Chairman Yeo has to leave due to other engagement. Let's give another round of applause to thank President Tsai and Chairman Yeo for joining us today. Thank you very much for your patience. Please take your seats. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Director of World Movement for Democracy, Ryota Jonam. Welcome. Welcome to the Global Assembly of the World Movement for Democracy. My name is Ryota Jonam. I'm representing the Secretariat of the World Movement for Democracy in Washington, D.C. First, I'd like to actually thank our local partners, namely Garden of Hope Foundation, IROG, Taiwan LGBTI Hotline, Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy, and Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, namely Katie Chen and Obi for working with us tirelessly to make this event happen and welcoming you today. So thank you, Taiwanese partners. Since last time we met in Dakar, Senegal in 2018, unfortunately, we have lost many of our great friends, colleagues, and mentors. I'd like to actually take a moment to honor them today. These, these are our friends and the mentor that help us grow as a world movement, and they are always with us. Now, we are here today together under the theme Claiming Democratic Future. The COVID rise of autocracy, the Ukraine war in well, Russia's Ukraine, in, uh, in Russia's war in Ukraine challenges that our local partners in Taiwan face every day. We see the future, our future is contested. We need to fight and work together to claim the democratic future. Overall, we have a great lineup of speakers to provoke your thinking and expand your imagination. The assembly's agenda is built, by, built on four pillars, civic space, information ecosystem, digital technology, and the next generation. Three days of assembly that you're going to experience today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow is structured as such that day one, we'll be deepening our understanding of challenges that we are facing. So you'll be having different conversation speakers to help us think through. Day two, the session focuses on 
sharing and learning of best practices, what's working, what's not working. Day three, we want you to join our partners initiative so we can take action together. Day three, as it was mentioned earlier, through the Democracy Courage Tribute, we will express our solidarity with democracy movements that demonstrated extraordinary courage these days. The assembly is a big networking platform. You are here because you want to meet old friends, partners, but also make new friends. So we have a different in informal activities that help you build a new partnership, but deepen existing ones. Another, um, another great networking tool that we're providing today is the assembly app. I'd like to pick your phone, download Cvent app. Search for the World Movement for Democracy Global Assembly. Use your assembly registration login information and organize your profile, play with your profile, and then you see updated agenda, what's happening today, what's happening tomorrow. And you can get connected with your friends and fellow part, uh, participants through direct messaging. Now, I don't want you to forget to follow us and engage in social media. Our hashtag is WM11Assembly. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to talk about security and safety. Uh, security and safety are very important to all of us. First, we have set up the secured Wi-Fi system, well, secured as much as possible. Um, please, look at, please look for the network named 11th Global Assembly, and then you will use the password on your name tag to log in. This way, you are, you are just connected to the network for this assembly. Second, we have been notified that several protests will be happening today outside of the hotel. So please be aware of the sound surroundings if you are going outside of the hotel. And please remember, if you see something, please say something. Now, please wear your name badge all the time if you are in this assembly area. Our security girls have been told by us and told by me that no one can access assembly activity area without badge. Wear your badge on this floor. If not, please remove it. While keeping the assembly space safe and secured, I hope assembly will, be, assembly will become a launching pad for greater unity among all of us as we seek to reverse democratic recession and work toward democratic future. Now, I'd like to invite Madam Chair, Maria Ressa, to take the stage. Okay, fantastic. All right, this is really exciting for me. So first of all, use the hashtag WM11Assembly. Please take out your cell phone. And then take that hashtag and prepare. I'm going to read to you a little bit of what Ann Applebaum has done. It is fantastic to have her here in Asia. Um, we, were, we grew up as journalists in the golden age of journalism. And, you know, I've, I've read her books, you know, some of them, uh, Iron Curtain, Gulag, this one was around the time when we were getting attacked in the Philippines, Red Famine, Stalin's War in Ukraine, and then this kind of epic one that, kind, that set a stage because she was looking at Europe, U.S., and the ripple across the world, right? But this one of, about the twilight of democracy. I talk a lot about something she coined, Autocracy Inc. And when enough illiberal leaders are elected to tip the balance and kill democracy, we walk into Ann Applebaum's Autocracy Inc. Let me give you just a little bit more about her. She writes for The Atlantic. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian, a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Agora Institute, where she co-directs ARENA, 
a program on disinformation and 21st century propaganda. She worked as a columnist at the Washington Post for 15 years, served as a member of the editorial board, and worked as the foreign and deputy editor of the Spectator magazine in London. She is all of this and so much more, living history, chronicling history, giving us the temperature check of this moment in time. Ladies and gentlemen, please tweet that. Tweet, Anne is speaking. You can watch the live stream at Move Democracy. Please tweet the link. Rappler is also live streaming. Please tweet the link. And let us welcome Ann Applebaum. Thank you so much. Thank you to Maria, one of my idols. Thank to all of you for being here. For some of you came a very long way. Um, and I, I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation and glad that I have this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. As we are sitting here, a brutal war is unfolding in Ukraine. Uh, the brutality is not only evident on the battlefield. Uh, Russian soldiers have rounded up civilians, beaten them, sent them to concentration camps, and deported them to Russia. When the Ukrainians liberate their territories, they find mass graves, they find makeshift prisons and torture chambers. This violence, the violence illustrates a central fact about the war, which is that this regime is fighting not just to occupy parts of Ukraine, not just to conquer Ukraine, but also to show the outside world that it doesn't care about human rights, about the laws of war, about respect for borders, or 70 years of European and UN diplomacy, and it will no longer pretend to do so. At the same time, on the other side of the world, Iranian police and security services are carrying out acts of brutality too. Young women and even schoolgirls have marched and demonstrated for the right to be unveiled, the right to travel and to work freely, um, the, the right to make their own decisions about their own lives. And their demands and the demands of factory workers who are on strike and sympathy have also been met with repression and arrests and violence. One young Iranian girl was murdered for singing a resistance song. Russians have also forbidden Ukrainians from singing Ukrainian songs. So different regimes, same tactics. Meanwhile, somewhat closer to where we're sitting, the Chinese Communist Party last week held a Congress that consolidated the one-man rule of Xi Jinping, who is now the de facto dictator of the largest country in the world. And he has come to enjoy this position by staging a war on corruption that turned into a mass purge, by inventing new surveillance tactics that control the movement of ordinary people, and by undermining the powerful democracy movement in Hong Kong and civil society around the rest of the country. Usually we think of these stories, Russia, China, Iran, as belonging to completely different geographic areas, different topics. We assume they have little relationship to one another. But the fact that they are all unfolding at once is not a coincidence, because in fact they're closely linked. And let me use the time that I have with you today to explain how and why. All of us have in our minds a cartoon image of what an autocratic state looks like. So there's a bad man at the top and he controls the police and the police threaten people with violence and there are evil collaborators and maybe some brave dissidents. But in the 21st century, this cartoon bears very little resemblance to reality. Nowadays, autocracies are run not by one bad guy, but by sophisticated networks of klepto kleptocratic financial structures security services, the military, the police, surveillance groups, and professional propagandists. The members of these networks are connected not only within a given country, but also among many countries. And so the corrupt state-controlled companies in one country do deals with the corrupt state-controlled companies in another. The police in one country can arm and equip and train the police in another. Uh, the propagandists also share resources, so the troll farms that, produce, that can promote one dictator's propaganda can, can, can be used to promote the agendas of another, and also the same themes, the themes about the weakness of democracy and the evil of the West. 
And this is not to say that there is some super secret room where the bad guys meet, you know, like in a James Bond movie. Um, nor does the new autocratic alliance have a unifying ideology. So among modern autocrats are people who call themselves communists, nationalists, and theocrats. And no one country leads this group. Washington likes to talk a lot about Chinese influence, but what really bonds the members of this club is a common desire to preserve and enhance their personal power and wealth. So unlike military or political alliances from other times and places, the members of this group do not operate like a bloc, but rather like a group of companies. You know, call it Autocracy Inc. Uh, their links are cemented not by ideals, but by deals. And the deals are designed to take the edge off Western economic boycotts or to make them personally rich. And that's why they can operate so easily across historical and geographical lines. So in this new world, Belarus is an international pariah in theory. So Belarusian planes can't land in Europe. Many Belarusian goods cannot be sold in the US or the EU. Belarus's brutality has been criticized by many international institutions, and Belarus's role in the war has been condemned. But at the same time, Belarus remains the site of one of China's largest overseas development projects. Iran has expanded its relationship with Belarus over the past year. Cuban officials have expressed their solidarity with Lukashenko, the, the Belarusian dictator at the UN, and of course, Russia offers markets, cross-border investments, and police backup, while Belarus, in turn, offers Russia a staging ground for its war on Ukraine. In theory, Venezuela is also an international pariah. And since 2008, the US, Canada, the EU, and many of Venezuela's South American neighbors have increased sanctions on Venezuela, a nation that's so badly run that actually Venezuela and not Ukraine is the largest source of refugees in the world. But at the same time, Nicolas Maduro's regime receives loans as well as investments from Russia and China. Cuba has long provided security advisors and technology to the country's rulers. Uh, the international narcotics trade keeps individual members of the regime well supplied with designer shoes and handbags. Uh, Leopoldo Lopez, a former mayor of Caracas, now in exile and in fact in this room, has observed that although Maduro's opponents have received some foreign assistance, it is nothing, nothing comparable to what Maduro has received internationally. Like the Belarusian opposition, the Venezuelan opposition has charismatic leaders and dedicated grassroots activists, and they've persuaded millions of people to go out on the streets and protest. And if their only enemy was the corrupt and bankrupt Venezuelan regime, they might win. But Lopez and the other Venezuelans in this room today know very well that they are in fact fighting multiple autocrats in multiple countries. Like so many other people propelled into politics by the experience of injustice, like Svetlana Sikhanovskaya in Belarus, like the leaders of the extraordinary Hong Kong democracy movement, like the Cubans and the Iranians and the Burmese people pushing for more open societies in their countries, they are fighting for, they are fighting against people who control state companies and can make investment decisions worth billions of dollars for purely political reasons. Uh, they're fighting against people who can buy sophisticated surveillance technology from China or bots from St. Petersburg. And above all, they're fighting against people who have inured themselves to the feelings and opinions of their countrymen, as well as the feelings and opinions of everybody else. Because Autocracy Inc. grants not just money and not just security to its members, but also something less tangible impunity. If once upon a time the leaders of the Soviet Union, the most powerful autocracy in the world in the 20th century, uh, cared deeply about how they were perceived by other countries, by their, by their own people, um, they vigorously promoted the superiority of their political system and they objected when it was criticized, even pounding their shoes on the table at the United Nations. But today, the most brutal members of Autocracy Inc. don't much care if their countries are criticized or by whom. The, the leaders of Burma don't really have an ideology beyond nationalism, self-enrichment, and the desire to remain in power. Uh, the leaders of Iran confidently discount any outside criticism on the grounds that it comes from infidels. 
The leaders of Cuba and Venezuela dismiss the statements of foreigners on the ground that they are imperialists. The leaders of China and Russia have spent a decade disputing the human rights language long used by the international institutions that they supposedly lead, arguing that these are Western concepts that don't apply to them. And the war in Ukraine is, as I say, one of the results. So impervious to international criticism, modern autocrats use aggressive tactics to push back against protest and widespread discontent. So Vladimir Putin, just for an example, was unembarrassed to stage so-called elections last year in which some nine million people were barred from being candidates. The pro-government party received five times more television coverage than all the other parties put together, and vote counts were mysteriously altered anyway. More recently, he stationed policemen next to metro stations to catch men and conscript them without any prior explanation or any rhyme or reason. But the Burmese junta is also unashamed to have murdered hundreds of protesters, including young teenagers on the streets of Rangoon. And the Chinese government boasts about its destruction of the popular democracy movement in Hong Kong and stonewalls any criticism of the camps and prisons it has built to lock up the minority Uyghur population. So at the extremes, this kind of contempt can devolve into what the democracy activist Sergei Popovich calls the Maduro model of government, named after the leader of Venezuela. Autocrats who adopt it are willing to pay the price of complete disaster to see their countries enter the category of failed states, accepting economic collapse, isolation, and mass poverty if that's what it takes to stay in power. So Assad has applied the Maduro model in Syria. It's what Lukashenko has created in Belarus. Uh, it seems to be what the Taliban had in mind when they occupied Kabul. Their goal was not a flourishing, prosperous Afghanistan, but an Afghanistan where they are in charge. The same is now true in Russia. Clearly, Putin is happy to cut the country off from the world, to end foreign investment, and preside over plunging living standards. And like the Taliban or the Venezuelan regime, he doesn't care about the wealth or well-being of ordinary Russians. That's not his goal, and it never will be. Nor does he care what anybody else thinks about that in the US and Europe, in Australia or Japan, in the UN or the OSC or the human rights community. In part, this atmosphere of impunity is made possible by the autocratic world's successful penetration of many established democracies. So there are many, many examples of this success, ranging from Russian information operations in American and French and other elections, to the business interests that help make Germany over-dependent on Russian gas, or countries as different as Turkey or Cambodia reluctant to criticize China. And some of these influence campaigns are quite subtle, offering not punishment or criticism, just opportunities. So some American and European companies uh, have come to understand, for example, that business deals will be presented. They will appear for those who learn to go along with the autocratic line. In 2018, for example, the McKinsey Corporation held a corporate retreat in Kashgar, just a few miles away from a large Uyghur concentration camp. And the event directly supported an element of Chinese propaganda, namely the Chinese argument that nothing bad is happening in, in Xinjiang. But McKinsey had good reason not to talk about human rights at the retreat. At the time, that firm was advising 22 of the 100 largest Chinese state companies, including one that helped construct the artificial islands in the South China Sea that have so alarmed the US military and, of course, the Taiwanese. Um, but maybe it's unfair to pick on McKinsey. After all, the list of major corporations caught in tangled webs of personal, financial, and business links to China Russia, Iran, and other autocracies is very long. You know, Russian money can buy former German chancellors, dinners with the British prime minister, and more. And not just property moguls, but banks and law firms in London, Luxembourg, Miami, Dubai, have long helped autocrats from Asia, Africa, and Latin America, as well as Europe, to launder and hide their money too. Sometimes the impact is hard to see. Um, these actions, you know, sometimes the in, in impact is hard to see, but these actions did contribute to an increase in inequality and corruption in the United States and Europe, 
helping to degrade democracy there as well. Um, part of the democratic world's inability to cope with the rise of autocracy Inc. does come from its own internal weaknesses, some of which have been exacerbated deliberately by autocratic actors. But maybe there's a lesson for us in this story as well as a warning. After all, if the leaders of the autocratic world are able to work together and to cooperate with one another, if they can help one another suppress internal opposition, teach one another how to use surveillance technology, then why can't the democratic world also work together to push back against them? And by democratic world here, I mean something very specific. Not just democratic governments, but also the democratic opposition in Russia, Hong Kong, Belarus, Iran, Venezuela, Burma, Saudi Arabia, Cuba and so many other states, too, too numerous here to list, um, people from all the countries represented in this room. For too long, we have all, all of us seen each one of our struggles as unique, which of course in some ways they are. But they are also connected, perhaps more deeply than ever before, by the fact that they face a common en enemy. So not Putin, not Xi, not Maduro, but Autocracy Inc. itself. Of course, some links between democracy activists around the world already exist, and the fact that you are all here in a single room in Taipei is evidence of that fact. Uh, the World Movement for Democracy, the Oslo Freedom Forum that will also take place here next week, uh, the World Liberty Congress that will happen in Vilnius next month, these are all meetings that are held precisely in order to deepen the ties between activists from around the world. But simply meeting is not enough. Uh, we should all begin to think rather of what we can do together. Where are the concrete areas of cooperation that might make a difference? So here's an example. Many people in this room work on kleptocracy and corruption, and many are very good at exposing theft in high places in their own countries. What if these projects could be internationalized with work shared and amplified in many countries? What if the investigators focused not only on their own countries, but on the connections between countries? What if we could find ways of telling that story in a manner that reaches more people on the YouTube channels and social media accounts that we all share? So many in this room also had the experience of lobbying their own governments about reform of the financial system to minimize corruption. What if that lobbying were coordinated internationally by people from dozens of countries across many time zones to focus on international kleptocracy? Maybe we could get better laws passed and maybe we could reach more people. But I could make the same argument about funding, technology, legal issues, the fight against autocratic propaganda as well. Um, in fact, this list is very long, uh, but it's not for me to present it. The extraordinary group of people gathered in this room, you are the experts and not me. And over the next decade, you will create the new coalitions that define the democracy movement, and you will come up with the technological and political solutions. You will find ways to carry them out together, and you will make them work. Let me end by noting that if the 20th century was the story of a slow, uneven struggle, ending with the victory of liberal democracy over other ideologies, communism, fascism, virulent nationalism, then it's true that the 21st century is so far a story of the reverse. Uh, the Stanford scholar Larry Diamond, who's also in this room, calls this an era of democratic regression. And every survey that you can think of demonstrates that this is the case, not only in the autocratic world, but in the world of established democracies too, where democratic decline is also a fact. But there's another way to look at it. Perhaps the autocrats are working together because they no longer have the confidence in their ability to fight their opponents alone um, and to fight the democracy movements alone. And perhaps autocracies are becoming less tolerant because they realize that their democratic opponents have better arguments, that people listen to them, and that the desire for political freedom will never go away. So perhaps this, the confrontation between autocrats and their populations are growing harsher precisely because democratic movements like the ones represented in this room are becoming more articulate and better organized. So I am certain that we have the brain power and the willpower here today to define and match the challenges of this new world. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about how you will meet them. Thank you very much.
Thanks so much. Um, brain power and willpower. I love that. So today from Anne, we heard that um, there's a physical interconnectedness, power and money, Autocracy Inc. Tomorrow we'll talk about the technology that also winds up working against us, showing how much more we have in common than we have differences. Now let's move to civic space, right? Let me call up fellow member of the steering committee, Maiko Ichihara, um, to moderate the next session, Civil Society's Reflection on Today's Challenges. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Maiko Ichihara, I'm Professor of International Relations at Hitotsubashi University, Japan. And I'm really honored to uh, moderate this session on civil society reflections on today's challenge. Um, well, this session is organized as a sort of reflection to Ms. Um, Ann Applebaum's uh, speech, which was delivered um, beautifully just now. And um, despite the challenges that we have in democracy today, we are fortunate to have courageous people um, fighting against um, those autocrats. And today we are having um, activists from Russia, Hong Kong, and Iran fighting um, against those aut autocrats. If I may um, introduce the speakers already. Um, the first speaker is um, Evgenia Chilikova from Russia. She's a Russian social and environmental activist and um, Goldman Prize winner for environmental activism in 2012. The next, next speaker is Mr. Nathan Law. He's a Hong Kong democracy activist and former student leader of the Umbrella Movement in 2014. <laughs> Finally, we have Mazia Bahari, uh, Iranian-Canadian journalist, filmmaker, and human rights activist. Then let me have a seat here, here now. So I would like to um, convey this um, session in a conversation style. And um, I want to um, raise questions to each of the speakers, um, probably starting um, Evgenia. Well, um, right now, um, you know, we are under this um, Russian aggression into Ukraine and um, Putin's, um, you know, impact onto the international society as well as to the Russian society and uh, Ukraine society has been um, pretty um, devastating. And, um, well, please um, walk us through um, as for um, how um, Put Putin's autocracy is right now. Is Putin modern autocrat, as um, Anna Applebaum um, describes? I want to say thank you a lot for organizing this absolutely incredible event. It's really a great opportunity for me, like for Russian activists, to reflect the situation with Putin regime. I think at this moment, we observe transformation of Putin regime from autocracy to real dictatorship regime who organize genocide on Ukraine. And uh, at this moment, Putin's regime 
to destroy Russian civil society. And I think that our big problem, then Putin regime, has never been punished on their crimes. And second problem, people like Schroeder and organization like Vansi, French company, uh, who collaborate with Putin regime, never are punished for their criminal, uh, for their criminal collaboration with Putin regime. And unfortunately, this process of corruption by Western world from side of Putin regime started many years ago. For instance, I want to share the story of my grassroots movement. 16 years ago, I, with my friends, we decided to organize uh, one of the first uh, grassroots movement, environmental movement to protect Himki forest. Because Russian authorities decided to cut down Himki forest for building motorway, Moscow, St. Petersburg. According to the Russian legislation, it was absolutely impossible. It was a real crime. And we organized the ecological camp and started to protect our forest. And Putin, Putin's authorities to answer violence. And uh, for example, a uh, member of our uh, team, independent journalist Mikhail Biketov, uh, he was brutal attacked by side of uh, Putin's authorities. And after this brutal attack, he became absolutely disabled person. And the big problem of this new project is that Putin regime decided to took money for building this highway from the Russian pension fund and sent this money to concessionaire of the project, Vansi company, French company. And this French company to spread money from Russian pension fund to different offshore zone, including uh, offshore uh, account on Cyprus, offshore of Arkady Rottenberg, closely friend of Mr. Putin. And we submitted this criminal case to French prosecutor office. And we, we wait answer from French prosecutor office during eight years. And the great pro problem is that this Vansi company who collaborate with criminal Putin's regime never answer for their crimes. And after this disgusting war against Ukraine, after February of, uh, and uh, after bombing of Kyiv, Vansi company announced that this company continued to collaborate with Putin's Russia. And the same problem was with the project Nord Stream 2. Many years, we are Russian activists to organize struggle against this disgusting pro project. And we demand from Germany authorities to stop any collaboration. But unfortunately, Germany authorities to continue to collaborate with Putin's Russia after bombing of Kyiv, after bombing of Ukraine, after genocide of Ukraine. And at this moment, we have a huge problem because Putin regime to organize real genocide of Ukraine people and Western world to continue to buy fossil fuel from Putin's regime. I think it's a real shame. And together, we need to stop it, to stop to feed to criminal Putin's regime. Thank you very much for um, this link um, between kleptocracy and autocracy um, and um, for its role um, has to be um, further more, um, discussed um, in this session. Then let me move on to um, Nathan. Well, um, the National People's Congress was just conveyed um, recently and um, Xi Jinping's third term for the next five years um, was determined. And um, China has been sort of projecting its image as a strong China. Um, with the use of sophisticated digital technologies um, and together with um, financial power as well. 
Um, could you walk us through um, as to how, um, what kind of strategy China is um, having um, in asserting it itself as a global power? Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for your introduction and, and your question. And thank you so much for coming this together, um, discussing the future of democracy and civil society. Um, I think it's really important for us to gather in Taiwan, this particular um, uh, island, this particular uh, political entity that is constantly being threatened by China, by the PRC, um, for possible military uh, in in invasion and annexation. Um, and as we have seen uh, for the past few days, the National People's Congress had its General Assembly. Um, it was, uh, as we know, um, Xi Jinping stepping up to centralize more power. The PRC has become a more aggress aggressive and threatening body to our global democracy. And it has become a much more one-man dictatorship than the one we used to describe that there were some checks and balances inside the party and it was more like a collective leadership. Um, so for now, situation I think is getting more tense and the Xi regime is getting more like a Putin regime. And it really creates a lot of uncertainty and a lot of worries to our future of democracy. When we look at the past few decades, this is actually the second time that I participated in the World Movement for Democracy. Last time I would say it was 2015, when I was a few years younger, uh, look younger definitely. Um, and uh, that was immediately after the 2014 Umbrella Movement. But then we didn't get much international support for our civil disobedience action in Hong Kong because the West, mainly the US, UK, and the other European countries, they were actually very friendly with China. The golden era term in the UK was just coined, and the US had been engaging in a very intimate business relationship uh, with the country, and that's why we didn't get much support from them. But when we look back now um, in 2022, in the 2019 Hong Kong protest movement, we indeed got a lot of support from around the world. And it really showed that the world has changed its stance and perception towards autocracies, towards the Chinese regime, and definitely towards the Putin regime. Um, for the past few decades, actually, China has been planning a lot of projects to really overturn um, the global order that we used to know. And for the past few years, we've had witnessed a drastic change in terms of how we deal with them. But I think it comes a bit slowly. But nonetheless, um, when we look at what China has been doing, first of all, they are paralyzing international bodies to make them incapable of holding autocracy accountable. They are also expanding their influence, flexing their muscle, in order to craft a world that is better for autocracy, better for dictatorship. And most importantly, they are reshaping and redefining democracy, freedom, and rule of law, so that they claim China is the largest and most functional democracy while the other don't work. And we've seen these like all out attack, no matter it's on ideological platform, resources, or even military. And we have been seemingly unable to amass enough resources to counter that wave of, as um, Larry pointed, uh, democratic regression. So I think it is really important for us together. Um, I, I've been in, in this um, collective uh, discussion with it um, um, seven years um, after my first participation into the World Movement for Democracy. We're definitely seeing activists from around the world coming together, thinking how we can help each other in order to navigate our way to expand our influence. But at the end of the day, I think um, what we need is these countries, democratic countries, coming together, amassing enough resources. And if we got all the democratic Democrat, democracies on board, we are definitely getting a much bigger influence. We were talking about more than half of the world's economy, and we've got enough resources to counter this democratic, democratic reception around the world. So it's, um, it's definitely an important section that we have to support each other, we have to support the civil society, and support the people who are on the ground, but also in um, the other countries, exile activists, to really make our point, to make the stories of Goliath versus, uh, 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 David versus Goliath into, um, uh, uh, in, in stories and in person. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Um, well, so the centralization of power in China is not just domestic thing, but um, well, the repercussion to the international so society is so strong. And we are now in, in this very intense 
sort of on the you know, you know, international order where we have to fight back those autocrats. Yeah, great. Um, well, next, um, let me ask a question to Mazari, uh, Mazia. Um, this is really um, emotional. Um, this becomes, um, you know, makes us very emotional to see those Iranian um, ladies fighting um, in the street um, after this 22-year-old um, uh, Mahsa Amini um, was um, killed um, allegedly um, in police custody for not wearing um, hijab properly in, uh, on September 16th. Um, and um, I heard that um, more than 140 people have died already. Um, please um, share with us on the current information, well, current situation in Iran. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And, and I think uh, as an old man talking about a movement that's being led by young women, I feel a little bit odd, but, and I have to apologize for being man and a woman, but then, uh, there is no young Iranian woman here, so I have to be their voice, I guess. So uh, what we are seeing in Iran right now is the beginning of the end of the Islamic Republic. It's the moment that the uh, people have, been, have realized that they've been betrayed. It's taken four decades for people to realize that there is no possibility to change the system. This is a regime that grew from a revolution that was popular, that people wanted to topple the dictatorship. Many people wanted to bring freedom, democracy, and equality, and an accountable government to power. And the Islamic Republic, which was established in 1979, it's an oxymoron because you cannot have a country like Iran which has many different nationalities, many different religions, and call it Islamic, and at the same time call it a republic. So people have been protesting for the past four decades, and they've been thinking that they can reform the system from within. I remember in 2009 when I went to the streets of Tehran and I saw millions of people marching silently in Iran. I was really amazed. And I really felt that the leaders of Iran, especially Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, would listen to people because that would be in his interest. Because even if he wanted to have this uh, uh, regional hegemony and you know, he wanted to be the leader in the uh, region or internationally as he aspires to be, he needed people's support. And people marched silently. They were asking for their rights as citizens of the country. They were not confrontational. They were not insulting. And of course, we know what happened. You know, I went to prison after a few days after that march. Many other people went to prison. Many people were killed. And 13 years later, we see young people in Iran they, their first slogan is death to the dictator. And then the second one is death to Khamenei. So they have no hope for any kind of reform within the system. And what they're proposing is very simple. Their, their chant is woman, life, freedom. What does that mean is that they want women to be respected because this regime grew from I mean, I don't want to give a history of Iran, but it grew from Khomeini's anti-woman uh, movement, which started in 1963. Many people forget how Khomeini came to power. He basically was against women having the right to vote in 1963. And many people followed him, and eventually he came to power in 1979. So they want women to be respected. Woman, life, freedom. What does life mean? Life means that they want the sanctity of life to be respected. They, want, they don't want people to be able to take someone into custody, like Mahsa Amini, as you mentioned, and just beat her up. And, you know, and that's why you know, many people in Iran sympathize with Mahsa Amini, identified with her, because young Iranian women, they could see themselves as a potential Mahsa. Any Iranian woman, can have the same fate as Mahsa in Iran. They can be arrested arbitrarily, they can be beaten up, and 
Many of them, unfortunately, have died like Massa. And uh, freedom. They just want to be free. There, it's a leaderless movement. It's a grassroots movement. It's not something that's led by people from outside. What is very interesting also in Iran right now is that no one says, long live so-and-so. It's just death to the dictator, woman life freedom. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, um, a lot of authoritarians actually bring up the um, cultural relativism argument, but um, your statement is really enlightening um, in a sense that, um, you know, well, despite maybe a more difference in terms of approaches cu culturally, um, human rights and governance norms like, like accountability, transparency, those are really well, universal values that we all share. Yeah, great. Then, well, given these you know, important moves that um, the civil society has been taking and, uh, and the causes that we are fighting for, which are um, universal values, um, I want to um, see the, well, see well, how much sort of chance that we have that we can win um, these wars against um, autocrats. Um, so my first question um, is for um, Evgenia, back, well, back to you. Well, in Russia, so um, the political space um, is still very tight. The journalism is under control and um, it's, not, it's not easy still to um, vocally um, talk about um, you know, criticism against Putin. And, and yet the network of those authoritarian um, well, regimes has been tightened um, further. So um, could you walk us through um, whether there is some um, opportunity and chances that um, those democracy movement can win? I think that for activists on Russia, really very important to give a voice. And for this reason, my team, we decided to organize special media portal uh, for activists and the name of this portal activatico.org. And if you open our portal, you can observe a map of Russia with dozens of different points. And each of these points, there are a different activity, grassroots activity. And at this moment, our new task, task of my team, uh, to give more information for Russian civil society about real situation with Putin's crimes against Ukraine. Why it's so important? Because unfortunately every day Russian citizenship to get a portion of poison from Putin's TV shows, from propaganda machine, and the mission my team uh, to spread real information about situation on Ukraine, about this disgusting war. And we disseminate this information widely. And thanks to uh, our media portal, we were able to organize support for grassroots groups on different parts of Russia. And uh, it was very important. Why? Because after this disgusting war against Ukraine, our network uh, to transform it to a network for support Ukraine refugees. At this moment, my team to help to organize a new network for support Ukraine war refugees. We focused on uh, people from Ukraine who were uh, uh, by R uh, Russian troops uh, to send people from occupied territory of Ukraine through filtration camps to Russian territory. And these Ukraine refugees became without papers, without documents, without money, without any resource. And uh, our new network to organize support for these Ukraine refugees. What we are doing? We organize escape from uh, use this Ukraine refugees from Russia to safety countries. We organize seven shelters around the world for these uh, Ukraine refugees and well, we organize a special uh, medical support for them. And we help more than 1,500 people to escape from Russia to safety places. And well, we organize for children from Ukraine 
uh, online schools because these children uh, became without education and it's a huge problem. And of course, we organize help with humanitarian staff. And I think that it's a win-win strategy when we are Russian activists to organize support for Ukraine refugees. For us, it's extremely important. Why? Because we show for world that Putin is not equivalent of Russia. We show that we are Russian activists. We are real Russia. We want to show for the world normal face of Russia. And I hope that in case of, uh, in case of collapse Putin regime, we are Russian activists to return to Russia and organize normal democracy on Russia. Thank you very much. It's indeed really important to differentiate uh, the state Russia and the Russian people and um, to mobilize the support from the Russian people um, for this um, cause for human rights and freedom um, is so important. Um, let me um, then um, ask um, Mazia the well, um, uh, next question um, about Iran. Well, um, so right now we are seeing those protests in Iran, but, in Iran, but this is actually not um, rare um, to see protests. Um, we have been seeing um, a series of protests um, every few years in, in the country. And um, we had, uh, you had the Green Movement in 2009 and then in 2000. Well, 19 and 10, uh, 20, you had this bloody November protest, and this time around, um, and this protest is now occurring. So I was wondering um, whether now what we are seeing right now is finally the breakthrough moment um, in Iran where we can bring f freedom there. Well, I don't think that the situation is tenable. Something will change at the end of this process. We are all surprised by the zeal of the, this young people for change. We are all surprised by the energy of the young people to go to the streets for almost 40 days. And speaking of 40 days, 40 days after someone's death is very important in Shia religion and in Shia Islam and also for the Iranian culture. So tomorrow, Wednesday, is the 40th day after Masa Amini's death. So we will see a mass protest in Iran, and I'm sure that the, both protesters and the regime, they have prepared themselves. What is very interesting about this set of protests is the spread, is the fact that it's, take, you know, it's been going on for 40 days. That's been surprising. And it's also the fact that it's being led by young women. These are the average age of protester in Iran these days is between 16 to 22. So these uh, young people, they do not have any memory of 1979 revolution. They do not know anything about Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s. And even for the Green Movement, which happened in 2009, they don't know much. They, they cannot, these young women, they cannot be more different from the aging men who are ruling Iran. The leader of Iran, he's 83 years old. The, his cronies, they are all in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Unfortunately, the average age for an Ayatollah is about 95, so I'm not sure when he's going to die. But uh, I think the moment that the supreme leader of Iran is going to die, something will change. But I think the change will come sooner. One possible scenario is that Iran from an authoritarian state, which it is now, will become a totalitarian state in a short term because the revolutionary guards, they have strategically positioned themselves to take over different uh, parts of the country, parts of the industry. The revolutionary guards is not only a military in Iran now, they have universities, they have hospitals, and they also own some of the biggest uh, industries in the country, and they, uh, they have shares in many even semi-private companies. So I think that whether this regime is going to collapse or it's going to be a dictatorship, a totalitarian regime, and then eventually that totalitarian regime will collapse because 
they, like any other totalitarian regimes, what they have to do in order to protect themselves is to uh, dedicate all the resources in the system in order to keep the system intact. And of course, they cannot provide for people uh, in other aspects, and you know, it, it can collapse. If you, as you know, uh, in 1981 in Poland, they established the military rule, and it took eight years for the Polish regime to fall. And I think it will be, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that it's gonna take eight years, I think it will be shorter, but I think some sort of scenario like that will happen in Iran. And it's very interesting to be in the same panel with someone from Russia and someone from Hong Kong, because I think what happened with Putin uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine this year, and uh, the Xi government's uh, threatening Taiwan and the behavior of the Xi regime, and also the alliance between Iran, China, and Russia, I think it's been a slap in the face uh, to the democracies, not a slap in the face in a bad way. I think it's a wake up call. I think the Western democracies have woken up that they should not be as reliant on Russia, China, and other dictatorships. Unfortunately, we see that sometimes they think that they can replace China or Russia with Saudi Arabia, which I think will have a similar disastrous uh, uh, results. So I think it's a wake up call. And hopefully, my hope, and you just have to live uh, with your hopes, is that in 10 years time, it will be a much better, much more resilient. We will see that uh, there is a much more resilient uh, dem dem democracies around the world. Thank you very much. Well, um, probably we, we should take the um, opportunity that we are now conveying this World Movement for Democracy that um, you know, tomorrow or when we have this 40th um, you know, uh, day um, from the death of um, this 22-year-old lady, um, we can probably show some solidarity um, for her and also for the women um, in Iran, um, hoping to make some, uh, you know, help them um, bring some breakthrough. Okay, so um, the next question is for Nathan. And I think um, we have still a bit of time, so maybe we can, uh, well, I can ask the same question um, to the rest of you as well. Um, so apparently, three of you are um, all outside of the countries. And um, it has been a very difficult time um, these days that um, a lot of um, democracy activists have been um, fleeing outside of the country and um, seeking exile uh, somewhere else. Well, um, say Nicaragua, Venezuela, Belarus, Burma, Afghanistan, Russia, Uganda, what have you. And um, there are apparently challenges as well as opportunities when you are in exile. So could you um, walk us through as to what kind of um, challenges and maybe also even well, including opportunities that you, you have been well, sensing? I left Hong Kong in June 2020, uh, just a few days before a um, sweeping draconian um, law, national security law, which criminalized free speech and put political activists behind bar uh, before it was um, enacted. And before that, I was a, a young student leader in 2014's Umbrella Movement. I was the youngest ever elected parliamentarian in Hong Kong, and I went to jail for my peaceful uh, protest. Um, as we can see, uh, there. For the past few years, um, there's been a wave of youth-led protests around the world, in Iran, in Hong Kong, in Myanmar, in Thailand, etc. And we've seen the aspiration of young people to change the society, to make our, our lives better, and to portray the kind of ideal world of them into the society. And for them, they, they have less burdens of family, they have more idealistic thoughts, and um, they are very passionate in hoping to change the world. But on the other hand, we've, we've heard a lot about the lack of political participation, participation of the youth in the West, especially in uh, parliamentary politics, especially in um, voting results, etc. And seemingly there's a gap in, in the way that um, we've seen a very active participation of young people uh, in protest, but they're not so involved in the traditional politics as we defined. And I think this is very important for us to talk about exile community and how we can try to be an example to reinvigorate, to encourage young people, especially in the democratic world, to participate in politics, to believe in the system in a way that um, 
that there should also be changes in the system. For these young people, they're, they're, they're actually very politically active. They're very concerned uh, by climate change, um, poverty, um, wealth gap. Um, you can see all the demonstration of, or, or like data about their active participation in these issues, but they don't believe in the political system that they are in that is capable of changing all those problems. They don't believe that their vote counts. And I think that is one of the major problems our democracies are facing, which young people, the source of change of society, have been seeing our electoral politics as um, a, a club, a backyard of rich and powerful people, but not a source of change. And I think if we don't try to change that situation, the problems that we are having will continue and we lack the support of that very powerful youth generation. And for me, after I, I live in a life of exile, I've been talking to a lot of schools, uh, secondary schools, like activists from around the world. And I think um, the, the personal stories of um, each of us indeed help them to understand um, why it is important for, the, for them to be involved in politics, to be involved in, in, in the campaign, which they were born with that right. Um, and for many of us, we sacrifice a lot to fight for them while we still don't get it. And I think the, these could give a lot of like, implication to, to mobilize them to, to, to step forward and to be involved. And for us, um, ex as exile community and living as a refugee in the United Kingdom, um, I think that there's always a big um, discourse about refugees saying that oh, we are victims, that uh, we, we need help, that we, we are um, 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 hopeless, etc. Um, definitely, there, 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 there should be a mechanism in helping a lot of the political refugees to start a new life. But we can also see them as fighters, as people who continue to speak up for their fellows, especially to those who are unable to step up for themselves. For example, in Hong Kong, after the enactment of the national security law, dozens of political um, organizations um, disbanded. Um, basically, all major independent news outlets are disbanded. Um, we, we've seen a sweeping, chilling effect on, on people, we, which there are no demonstration at, no, at, at, at all for now, because whenever you host one, you get arrested immediately. We've seen that things happening around the world, including in Hong Kong, while um, people on the ground, they cannot speak up, and that responsibility a bit of a shift to the people in the exile community that we need to use culture, we need to use community work, we need to use advocacy work to really step up and continue that struggle. Um, so I think it, we are talking about exile community. We are best demonstration of the values that we all treasure, freedom, democracy, rule of law, and we indeed need help from around the world to continue our struggles overseas. And we are, as well, advocates and fighters for our causes. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, the... The, the younger generations um, becoming apolitical and um, losing hope for change um, is, uh, well, well, actually in an interesting contrast um, to Mazia's um, point where um, those uh, younger and, you know, generation in Iran are actually having different experiences compared to the older generation. And so, well, you, we can actually expect a bit of different type of protests or behaviors. So it might um, also depend on, depend on the um, you know, culture, country, history, but um, well, maybe we can also um, keep some hope for the younger generation. Um, well, you know, in a totalitarian state or in authoritarian uh, countries, being apolitical is a political act. Because when the state tries to uh, give you this ideology throughout your life, and especially in Iran, whose leader is supposed to be God's uh, representative on earth, and you don't believe that, and you just want to be yourself and don't want to believe that, I think that is the most important political act you can have. And you know, this apolitical slogan in Iran, woman, life, freedom, there is nothing, no mention of politics in that, but it's the most potent uh, political slogan that you can have. 
And speaking of being in exile, I, I think I have a good reason for being outside of Iran because I have a 16-year sentence for me. So if I go back to Iran, I, can, I have the freedom to go back to Iran, but I don't have the freedom to come out. And I think I can, uh, be, I can be available to reflect the voice of people in Iran. And one thing that I think we all may agree is that as people outside of the country, we should not even pretend that we can be the leaders. People inside the country, they are the leaders. They are the people who are risking their lives. I mean, I'm in Taiwan now, I can just go out, have a drink, you know, go for a jog, you know, go for yoga, whatever. In Iran, that is not possible. In Iran, I would be a dead person. So I think for me, even to pretend that I'm a leader, that's a betrayal of, you know, my responsibility. That's why uh, when I came out of Iran, we established this website called IranWire, and IranWire is basically a platform for Iranian journalists, and it's interesting to see Maria here because we learn a lot from Raffler. It's a, it's a platform for Iranian citizen journalists to be in touch with hundreds of Iranian professional journalists who are in exile. So it's just a platform to be together. But again, because we are talking about a dictatorship, authoritarian state, whatever we do is political. I mean, I'm an accidental activist. I never wanted to be an activist. I always tried to avoid any kind of activism. But if you just want to survive as a journalist and work as a journalist, or a filmmaker, you have to be an activist this time, so. Wonderful, thank you. Then, um, Afghania, please. I think at this moment, it's extremely important to save people, to save life for Russian activists who escape from Putin's Russia. Because at this moment, in Russia, we have really very high price of the protest. For simple anti-war pickets, when you stay on uh, uh, on street of Moscow, on other uh, cities of Russia, with uh, uh, small, uh, transparent, with only two walls, not war. After that, you have a good chance to come to prison for 10 years. And I think it's really very sad that at this moment, Russian activists who want to escape from uh, Russia to safety places have a horrible problems. And my colleague activists have a horrible problems with legalization. And it's really extremely difficult to get a visa to European countries and to get status of refugees. And I think that at this moment, it's, it's, it's extremely important to save lives of activists. Why it's so ex important? Because uh, when people to escape from Putin's Russia, they organize support of Ukraine refugees. They organize anti-war uh, campaigns on different parts of the world. And thanks to these skills, we are Russian activists, have a chance to return to Russia and organize normal democracy country. And I think that at this moment, it's really extremely important to help for Russian activists. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, then we don't, well, um, it's about the, uh, the end of the time. So well, I, I would like to have um, some final comments from all of you, maybe in one minute or so, starting with Nathan, please. Well, um, we've lived through decades which democratic world has been complacent about the rise of authoritarianism. We've been complacent about how we have mechanism to hold them accountable. We've seen the results. We are too independent, we're too dependent on China. We're too dependent on Russia. And they have been reshaping the world in a way that they can act to protect their interests, especially those people who are in power and in power so that they can abuse people to retain in power. I think this has to be changed. We have to see the rise of authoritarianism as our global threat. We have to get together to amass resources. We have to work with exile community because exile community are the clear demonstrations of the struggles that we are facing. 
that um, the lies of these dictatorship um, are so blatant, and we are the proof for that. And of course, we also have to support underground activists. They are the key roles. They are the main source of rebellions. Um, and for us, we can act as amplifiers. We can act as a voice for them to make sure that the world knows what they need and how we can help them. So I think there's a, a lot of room for um, cross-movement, collaboration, a lot of roles that each of you can play in the whole campaign of supporting global democracy and global democratic struggles. And um, it's really important for us to make sure that our younger generations is included, that they feel they're empowered, that they feel they have a role in all sorts of political actions that we can organize so that they be the, they'll be the spearhead of change. Right, thank you very much. Mazia, please. Uh, yes, so I think there are so many uh, issues that I want to discuss. We were talking about refugees now. And I live in the UK, and I feel uh, ashamed that the government of the country that I'm living in wants to send refugees to the UK, uh, to Rwanda, which is a dictatorship. Just imagine being an Iranian refugee or a Russian refugee, and you don't get any uh, appointment at the embassy, and you really are desperate to get away. You risk your life, you get on a boat, you get to the UK, and then at the end of it, you know, instead of welcoming you, they want to put you on a plane and send you to Rwanda. That's a shame, but that shows how vulnerable Western democracies are. That shows that you know, Western uh, citizens of Western democracies and democracies around the world, they should not be too smug about living in democracies, and they should be careful about losing their rights as citizens of democracies. As we saw in the United States, democracy is really vulnerable. There are authoritarian tendencies among many people. As you know, uh, Trump said, you know, when he went to CG, he liked what he saw, and he wanted to have a regime similar to that in the United States. Yes, of course. I mean, I was uh, with someone yesterday, and we saw the prime minister of Swaziland uh, walking out, and someone was chanting. I like to have someone chanting for me while you know, I walk out of the hotel room. But you know, so we have to be aware of these tendencies in Western democracies and democracies around the world. And at the same time, I think now that we have gathered here, people who, are care, care, people who care about democracies, people who have experiences in uh, democratic movements, I think we just have to share ideas share technology and share the resources in order to be able to support each other. Because if Putin can solidify his power in Russia, it means that he can support Khamenei's regime in Iran. If she can be dominant in the, in, on the global state, it means that he can have his cronies all across Africa, in different parts of Latin America, in Iran, and in, in other places in the Middle East. So I think uh, we have to be, as people who live in democracies, we have to respect what we have. We have to care what we have. It's like a, really a fragile thing. Democracy is really a fragile thing, and we have to really uh, cherish it and nourish it. And at the same time, democratic activists and people who care for democracies, they have to be together, and I think uh, in the next couple of days, we have the opportunity to talk about experiences and share experiences and resources. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe um, in one minute, finally, Evgenia. I want to say thank you so much for this incredible se session. And I think that together, we, we can win Putin's regime. It's possible, I know. and. Uh, I hope that one day we organize the same conference on Russia. It's my big dream. Well, thank you very much. Well, well now that we are having um, those 
autocratic giants of China, Russia, Iran, um, those countries um, trying to change the international order. And we are now at a uh, well, even bigger um, sort of uh, well, um, fight together. And um, we will um, need to be tactical in how to mobilize those younger generations, and especially those people who are support of us fighting inside of the, the countries. So um, I hope that um, the, the next three days and two days are gonna be the, the days where we can really discuss how to do it, how to support the people. Thank you very much for the th speakers, and thank, thank you very you. much, everybody. Thank you very much, Michael, for wonderful moderation. But guys are working together. We have to work together harder. So that's the main message that we get this morning. Now we welcome you to a coffee break for 30 minutes. 11 o'clock, we're going to hear the lessons learned from Taiwan. How Taiwanese democracy activists have been able to get here to make this country thrive. This democracy, this Taiwanese democracy is a democracy, democratic resilience and innovation. So next session after coffee break, we're gonna learn more about Taiwan. Enjoy the coffee break, thank you. Thank you. Are you okay? Yeah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine. <laughs> you don't have a coffee? coffee. Uh, uh, no, 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 okay. not right now. Good. Thank you. Okay. I hope everything will good. Yes. <laughs> good. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to the World Movement for Democracy Global Assembly's Taiwan panel. I hope you guys uh, enjoy your, the coffee break um, and uh, some snacks. Um, but now I want to welcome all of you back um, to this panel to talk about uh, a little bit uh, about Taiwan civil society as um, Head Director Zhang mentioned and President Tsai mentioned, the role of civil society is really important uh, to Taiwan's democratization and the liberalization process. Um, so Taiwan actually is often hailed as the beacon of democracy in the region and one of the freest country um, also. So this uh, panel uh, will present an overview of Taiwan's democratization and uh, the role of civil society in cultivating and sustaining Taiwan's vibrant democracy. Um, we have five Taiwan civil society representatives. Um, of course, um, I'm representing the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. Um, Ms. Ingrid Liao represents the Garden of Hope. Uh, Zhi Hao Yu represents the Information Operation Research Group. Uh, Shang Du represents um, the Taiwan Tongzhi LGBTQ Hotline Association. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, we have Mr. Alvin Zhang um, from the Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy. So this panel, um, we will share our personal experience and observation of Taiwan's democracy and how um, these four representatives um, have worked diligently to facilitate partnership with our respective de democratic partners and also um, to keep uh, in political institutions and government agencies uh, in check. And um, so without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panelists. First, we have Ms. Ingrid Liao. She is a graduate from the National Zhengzhi University and she received a master's degree from journalism in Taipei. Um, she also obtained a Master of Public Administration and Urban Studies from San Diego State University in California. Um, through the 1980s, 
Ingrid was involved in combating child sexual trafficking when Aboriginal underage girls in Taiwan were trafficked to, uh, from remote mountain villages to the dark city corners. And she's devoted in um, trying to stop commercial sexual exploitation of children. Um, Ingrid started to set up the Rainbow Project under, under the Presbyterian Church in Taiwan. And together with her colleagues, she also initiated and established the Taiwan Women Rescue Association and, of course, the Garden of Hope. So I'm very much looking forward uh, for Ingrid to share her experience. And next to Ingrid, we have Mr. Zhihao Yu. He's the co-director of the Information Operation Research Group. Zhihao, um, is an, an um, I, uh, IORG is a civil society research organization that uses data science to facilitate public discourse, counter information manipulation, and strengthen democratic resilience in Taiwan. And Zhihao is a software engineer and information designer by training, and he's also an active contributor to GovZero, uh, Taiwan's civ civic hacking community. Next to Zhihao, it's Shang Shizhen Du. He is the Secretary General of the Taiwan Chongzhi Hotline Association. Um, uh, we call him Xiao Du. <laughs> Xiao Du joined Hotline in 2002 as a volunteer and has since been actively involved in the work of LGBTI rights and HIV prevention. He became the Director of Poli uh, Pub Policy Advocacy of Hotline in 2011 and uh, the Secretary General of Hotline in 2021. Um, Mr. Du's work includes social education, gay men's sexual health, workplace equality, and international affairs. He, is, he was a, a key member in the Marriage Equality Coalition Taiwan, and also a board member of persons with HIV and AIDS, Rights Advocacy and Association of Taiwan. And of course, um, you guys already met uh, Alvin Yumong. Um, he is the head director of the Taiwan Youth Association of Democracy. Um, he's also the founder of um, TYAD, and he has, he has dedicated his work uh, to promote the importance of youth empowerment. And he has done that for many years, as, it, as young as he looks. He's done it for, for a very long time. Uh, since high school. Um, Alvin has participated in social movements and gained uh, nutrients and experience within the movement's activity. Um, I actually saw Alvin um, on the streets when uh, I was uh, researching on Taiwan social movement uh, and, and uh, uh, how, th how that implicates Taiwan's democracy when Alvin was still a high schooler. So without further ado, um, I think first, I will ask them questions so they could share their experience with you. And at the end, uh, I will open the floor up for some question and answer. So I think I want to direct the first question to um, Ingrid Liao of Garden of Hope. So Garden of Hope has been, lead, has been a leading organization in advocacy for women's and children's rights and protection uh, in, 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 tai, in Taiwan and around the world for 30 years. So what inspired you to work with this issue in the beginning, and what are the key findings of new advocacy opportunities and create a diverse range uh, of services uh, substantially? Uh, thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, I think uh, I just want to tell, uh, tell you that uh, the, the Garden of Hope, how it is uh, come into being. I think uh, many years ago, the uh, international Ch Christian organization called Asian Church Women's Conference, they held a consultation on tourism and prostitution in Taipei. And I was representing the Presbyterian Church in Taiwan to head a Taiwan situation report. In prepare of this uh, report, I conducted a few research in Huaxi Street, the so-called snake alley. Uh, now it abolished <coughs> already. Um, Excuse me. The, 
because I can I could uh, go there uh, directly because it's very tight control. So uh, I I got the help from the Aboriginal Aboriginal youth mm. to help me, and uh, the findings was quite astonishing. Mainly, uh, there are more than 60% of uh, Abri Aboriginal girls underaged uh, to traffic uh, to the Brussels illegally. And uh, the other finding uh, mainly is uh, the younger the girl, such as uh, 13, 14, 15 years old, the more male users they received. And uh, I also find uh, several elements uh, of human trafficking exist, which include the usage of, uh, of deceptive or fraudulent means to lure the family, dead bondage. The, the third one is confiscation of important documents. Fourth is deprivation of personal freedom. Fifth, transferring the victims from one place to another. The sixth is the severe penalty if the victims wants to escape. This is pretty much like the Cambodian cases nowadays. So when all the facts review, the church group, PCT, uh, started a series of uh, education and prevention courses in the mountain areas. And human rights groups, uh, women's group, and Aboriginal girl, uh, groups all organized to uh, stage demonstration um, and the other protest uh, activities. Garden of Hope was then set up and, uh, and it, is, it was the product of this social movement. And because at that time in Taiwan, the victim had al almost nowhere to go. So uh, Garden of Hope was named and designed uh, originally as shelter or halfway house for the victim girls. And I became the founding board member of the Garden of Hope Foundation. But uh, when uh, this service-based uh, group soon became the advocacy group, uh, because uh, a lot of uh, crucial reasons has, had been not uh, resolved. So in 1995, after uh, about seven or eight years, the anti-CSEC law enacted. CSEC means commercial sexual exploitation of children. And uh, we call it now the Child and Youth Sexual Exploitation Prevention Act. And I think it, this is one of the most advanced law in Asia. And uh, the passage of this uh, act became the milestone to terminate the domestic child sex trafficking in Taiwan. And Garden of Hope worked with other organizations at that time, play an important role to draft the act. Now, Garden of Hope, uh, we uh, operate, currently we operate 16 shelters and in last year, 362 women and children sheltered. We have uh, different uh, service recipients, such as survivors of uh, human trafficking, survivors of incest, survivors of uh, women of uh, domestic violence and their children, including new immigrants and uh, migrant workers. And we also shelter girls with unexpected pregnancies and LGBTQ plus members. Uh, because we have uh, a lot of uh, project and program, and because of nine uh, time limits, I, I only introduce you one program. We call it uh, Go the Second Mile uh, program. This is the uh, expanded uh, services to help rebuild the lives of uh, domestic uh, violence uh, survivors af after they leave emergency shelters. Uh, the service includes child care, employment and life support, plus residential resources. The post-shelter service resulted in 
in 70% of users became financially independent, and 97% of users eliminated or significantly reduced violence in their lives. We always uh, get new inspirations through reflections during the process of serving the survivors. We look for good uh, root problems and advocate to change law and instigate policy implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Yeah. Um, Um, the Garden of Hope had been, has been around for a very long time. It's one of the pioneering organizations um, that assists uh, teenage uh, prostitutes and uh, fight, uh, combat and fight against human trafficking. Um, I actually learned a lot from Ingrid and her organization on an extent to which how they champion for this important cause. And I also know that you guys have um, a network of uh, battered women's shelters through our region, so Garden of Hope is really expanding um, as we speak. So um, I want to move to uh, Zhihao. So um, IORG is comparatively a young NGO compared to Garden of Hope, who's been around for the past uh, three decades. And um, your organization work uh, on one of the most pressing challenges uh, for Taiwan and of course for democracies uh, around the region and the world. So how did you get involved with Information Operation Research Group? And um, <clears throat> what has your experience been working with uh, a civil society organization? Mm, thank you, Katie, for the question. Um, yes, IORG is a very, very young um, NGO here in Taiwan. Um, um, I remember at the time, um, in around 2018, 2019, me and my colleagues, uh, we were working at live fact-checking um, initiatives during political debates, maybe mayoral debates, maybe presidential debates. And <clears throat> we, we realized that fact-checking for us was not the solution to the things that we were worried about, which is deteriorating public debate, deteriorating public discourse. Um, and we wanted to do something more. Um, me and my colleagues decided that we want to use data science to actually learn about Taiwan's information environment, um, to actually try to identify problems with data, because we all know that the public discourse here is very vibrant and very diverse, and uh, we have to have uh, technologies on our hands to, to try to all understand the overall situation. So I think that's what we decided to do. And uh, fortunately, we were able to find research funding, uh, sub supports from both foreign and, and domestic uh, foundations and organizations, and keep working uh, on, on, on what we do. Um, and during the process, uh, because some of my colleagues come from traditional social activism, we are able to combine our work of data science with traditional NGO works, local NGOs, local community activists. Um, they, are who, they are those who are actually on the front line of uh, so-called uh, this fight against disinformation. They are the ones who are in the communities who uh, are <clears throat> experiencing bad consequences of our maybe polarized political discussion maybe non-fact-based discussions um, that, are, um, that are issues for not only Taiwan, but a lot of different countries in our region and across the world. Um, so we were able to connect with them and also learn from them. We could share our research findings to them and let them know the bigger picture, but also learning from their own life experiences what um, so-called fake news is like in our local communities. What are they experiencing and what are their problems? I think those are, um, as a very young NGO here in Taiwan, we're very uh, fortunate and very uh, uh, thankful that Taiwan has such a vibrant civil society uh, for us to uh, share, not only share our experiences and our expertise, but also to learn from this very rich um, rich history of Taiwanese people organizing ourselves and trying to make our country better. Mm. Thank you very much, Thank Chihau. you. Um, like IORG and uh, uh, some of the 
uh, civil society organizations in Taiwan that combats uh, information warfare. Um, um, what I'm really happy to learn is that they publish bilingual reports, uh, reports in Mandarin Chinese and also reports in English. So um, if you want to check out IORG's website and some of the colleagues um, in, in our audience from Taiwan, um, I think I, I strongly encourage you to do so. So um, let me move down to Sean. So we have seen um, many advancements made in the LGBT right protection in Taiwan over the past decade. Um, and Hotline has uh, played a very significant role um, in achieving these milestones. So can you share with us your experience in promoting LGBTQI rights and how your organization assisted in, accomplishments, in, in, the, in the accomplishments that we're seeing here in Taiwan? Uh, thank you, Katie, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm Xiang or Xiaodu. So uh, I want to share with you about the LGBT movement in Taiwan. So LGBTQI movement in Taiwan started uh, to organize in 1990s, and it's benefited from democratic and social movements uh, after martial law was lifted especially from the women's movement that's opened the space to discuss gender equality. An important law, the Gender Equity Education Act, was enacted in 2004, and it is the first law that includes the concept of SOGI uh, issues like uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. And it provides us opportunity to teach about LGBTQI issues to young generation, and which is very rare in Asian countries. And uh, by face-to-face -face lectures with real-life stories, we are able to change uh, audience thoughts on LGBTQI and get more support gradually. And after years of effort, uh, the LGBTQI movement in Taiwan finally reached legalizing same-sex marriage in 2019. This painstakingly journey includes legislative lobby, litigation, constitutional interpretation, and referenda. So these are all the routes that a uh, country can, can pass uh, same-sex marriage, and we have it then all. Yeah. And uh, to change the law does not only require lobbying legislators, but also mobilizing public support. So to, to, to pursue marriage equality, Hanlai has formed the Marriage Equality Coalition with other gender organizations to organize lobbying, a media campaign, public rallies, and community empowerment, as well as to network with organizations in a range of professional fields, such as law, psychology, and social work. In addition to Hanline, many domestic and foreign groups and individuals have put their efforts together to achieve this outcome. This has not been a smooth uh, journey during which we've encountered the resistance of anti-LGBTQI Christian groups who went into the fight with plenty of funding and resources, and they are also connected with uh, like uh, anti-LGBT groups um, abroad, especially in the U.S. However, the law was passed eventually, and Taiwan became the first country in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. Now we are moving to the next stage and trying to make, <coughs> sorry, trying to make regulations and systems more LGBTQI friendly and inclusive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. It, it, it was a very um, long journey um, so for Taiwan to achieve uh, marriage equality. And also, we know that there's still uh, room for improvement. So Hotline and um, their colleagues are working really, really hard and diligently to try to achieve um, <clears throat> their goals to try to make Taiwan an even more LGBTI community-friendly country. So, um, and Hotline has been around for how many years now? 25, 25 years. <laughs> 25 years. And Hotline is also part, uh, a, a partner in organizing the uh, Pride Parade this coming Saturday. That's the 20th year. Oh, yeah. Can I also do some uh, 
Okay, yeah, so actually, <laughs> Halai was, <laughs> sorry, thank you, Katie. So Halai is, uh, was the first uh, host to organize the Taiwan L3 Pride. And now uh, the Taiwan L3 Pride just uh, have its uh, 20th anniversary this year. Yeah, so it will be bigger than ever. So it will be on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Bigger than ever. Yeah, and you are very welcome to join us. And also, besides the Taiwan L3 Pride, we also, Hanlai also organized a smaller march. It's called the Taiwan Transgender March, which will be uh, held uh, like on Friday evening, just near uh, in Ximending area. Yeah, so it's a more grassroots uh, small rally with uh, transgender, uh, uh, non binary. Uh, activists, groups, and uh, supporters, and you are also very welcome to join us. Thank you. Um, and of course, TYAD was a co-sponsor and co-organizer of uh, Pride also this year. Right. So let me move on to Yumeng. So we have um, two organizations that's been around for a couple of decades, and then we have two younger organizations. So um, I want to ask Alvin, um, the Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy is an organization that only promotes youth rights and participation, but is also managed by a relatively young staff. Um, how do you think the experience of um, the older generation NGO workers in Taiwan facilitate the work for your organization? And also, how have voices from the younger generation like TYAD contribute to the local civil society? Thank you, Katie. And in fact, in 2015, when I was only an 18-year-old high school student, because of the call of the civil, civic groups at that time, yeah, and just like us, <laughs> I joined the uh, uh, amendment, constitutional amendment movement to lower our voting age. Although my our efforts at that time uh, was unsuccessful, but uh, me and the participants around me were trained to be an like young social activist. Activist in 2018, we established the TYAD Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy. In 2019, the student associations around Taiwan in every campus, they uh, established another groups, another association was so-called the Taiwan Student Associations. After the establishment of our TYAD, I found that what really shocked me and uh, I'm really proud of is that Taiwanese civic groups has a very, very strong network and uh, we, have, uh, we have entered this network through, uh, in the past we were like uh, individuals, but now we are like groups or like associations. So uh, in the past I was empowered but now I'm also empowering others like uh, students, like young people, like uh, younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, after we joined this big, <laughs> big network and very strong network, I think uh, I felt that this network really share uh, very uh, many resources in this network. And like groups have uh, like, uh, these groups are never shy to share their experience or to share their resources. Like, uh, for example, uh, when we were found, founded in 2018, at that time we have our local election just like this year. And uh, we've uh, launched a campaign called Take It Back Home. So we call uh, youngster to go back to their hometown to vote. At that time, we've also ho held a big, big uh, press conference. And uh, we held this conference with all the uh, NGOs in Taiwan. And after we 
invited all the NGOs, although I think they, at that time, didn't know who we are. <laughs> but they all come here, and they all see the uh, student associations from all over the world. And I think this is the very strong network are growing and are getting bigger and bigger. And so uh, I think uh, this is the, uh, the thing that we are very proud of, Taiwan and the network in Taiwan. And so like uh, Xiaodu has just mentioned that uh, this week we have our uh, Pride Parade this week and I've been uh, the participants, but this year we've also been the NGO and we can uh, lead a group and we've, we all bring many high school students all around Taiwan to the uh, Pride Parade to see uh, Taiwan has passed our uh, gay rights law and Taiwan has been very uh, doing many effort to uh, that the world see that gay rights uh, are our uh, basic value in Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Um, one of the things that, um, do you want to applaud Alvin? <laughs> Make some people. Big <laughs> round of applause for Alvin. One of the um, things that I find very important that these um, Taiwanese NGOs are doing is also um, to educate, to educate the public um, what they need to be aware of, pay attention to, uh, to fight against. So um, I think all of them are doing that uh, right now. Um, I'd also want to mention that we uh, feature the four organizations on the panel because they, they uh, deal with the issue of youth, youth participation, LGBTIQ community, information warfare, women's rights. Um, but uh, through um, this uh, assembly, we also invited uh, quite a few uh, other members of civil society who will be here for the next uh, few days. And um, please, I strongly urge you to speak to them, um, to talk to, to them, and learn from an experience. And also, it's, it, it's a, a learning experience for, uh, from, uh, for Taiwanese uh, civil society organization uh, to, uh, to learn from you as well. So make friends and, and have good discussions and, and partner up on the is important issues regarding uh, democracy and human rights. Um, so um, I want to get back to Ingrid um, about uh, her experience. And I was wondering, um, Ingrid, from your observation, um, how was the women's rights advocacy in Taiwan transformed um, for as long as you were involved in, in the past uh, three decades? And how would you encourage uh, young NGO workers and those who are interested in, in advocating for women's rights. Thank you, Katie. Um, the development of uh, Taiwan women's uh, movement has four major areas. First, it begins with the, the challenging the concept and perceptions of traditional women's status. It was necessary to modify family law of the civil codes to elevate the rights of, of women. The issues like uh, whether the, the wife took crown husband's surname or uh, women's inheritance rights. And the issues like child custody and the community of or uh, separation of property between husband and wife the, or the mutual address of husband and wife, it's, it's said, uh, mandatory to uh, indicate uh, to husbands. So uh, the, the modification of the law uh, has been uh, processed for a, a very uh, gradual and uh, long time, long process. So among the, the above mentioned issues, um, the woman's inheritance rights was the most difficult to execute. So uh, the second uh, the major area is the, the safeguard for women's per personal safety. So uh, there are uh, several uh, law, pass law passed. First, in uh, 1997, the sexual assault 
Crime Prevention Act passed. In 1998, the Domestic Violence Prevention Act passed. And in two and five, Sexual Harassment Prevention Act also passed. And recently, uh, in Taiwan, I, I think the women groups uh, worked for so long time. Last year, in December, uh, a Stalking and Harassment Prevention Act finally passed. I think the passage of all these laws uh, was to protect the vulnerable and disadvantaged group in the society. And the Garden of Hope uh, was involved very deeply. And the third uh, major part is the promotion of gender equality in workplace. In 2002, after the uh, alteration of the central government and uh, the, the proposed act uh, was lying uh, in legislative union for more than 11 years, uh, and the act of gender equality of empowerment, employ, employment has finally passed and the lengthy waiting period proved the hardship of this process because we had a lot of obstacles. Uh, it's uh, make the, the, the process of legislation is very, last very long. And so uh, it, it, the act uh, um, clearly defined equal opportunity for recruitment and uh, promotion, et cetera, in the workplace and equal pay for equal work, and no discrimination against marriage and pregnancies. You can imagine uh, maybe 20 some years ago, if, if a woman, they, uh, they are pregnant, maybe they, they are not keep their jobs. So the, the, pass, uh, the passage of the law is guarantee the equality of women uh, in, the, in the workplace. And in 2021, last year, the, this act modified that both parents can take parental leaves at the same time. And they can receive child, child care allowances to 80% of their salary from original 60%. This is uh, providing the very uh, friendly uh, surroundings for the husband and wife to take care of their uh, babies because uh, it's, this is to uh, response the very uh, the, in, the decreasing birth rates in Taiwan. So uh, finally, the fourth major part of uh, women's uh, movement is women's political participation. Uh, women's rights movement uh, also focus on encouraging women to take part in the decision making position and strive for political status. In Article 33 of gov uh, Local Government Act, it indicates that the local electoral district, if there are four representatives to be elected, there should be one female among the elected. So the result is in 2018, a local woman representative elected was up to 32 of uh, city and county, and 35% in municipalities, like a Taipei city, you know, the big cities. They have different levels in the local district. So it's up to 32 and 35. And it, at the central uh, level, the, about the legislators, among total 113 legislators, now, uh, there are 47 female legislators, accounting for 41.6%. It's the highest ratio in Asia. And although Taiwan is not the UN member, uh, but uh, many relevant NGO groups, uh, they form the CEDO uh, Alliance and the CRC Alliance. And and usually they meet together and oversee the content of the, the conventions. So, and Govern Hope is one of the, the core members of these alliances. And, and I will respond to the second question of your, uh, to, to find, uh, 
to uh, ask uh, young people to join the NGO groups. I think uh, uh, vibrant NGOs and uh, civil society organizations constitute the solid democracy. And many youngsters, um, they want to get involved to change society and to resolve social problems. But they must realize that this, the tasks are complex and take a long time to produce results with limited uh, in resources. But on the other hand, when working for an NGO, you give your passion, your care, and the professional skill to seek just and fair society. It can cultivate your talents, develop your potential, and have a sense of achievement when you devote yourself to serve those in need. Uh, in Taiwan, over the past 30 years, there are very, uh, there are vast improvements in various uh, concern areas, such as the open and transparent political surroundings and the, the uplifting of uh, lab labor rights, the environmental protection, and also women and children's rights. We can see how much the NGO have contributed to society. So uh, please come join us, <laughs> the young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ingrid. Um, I know Ingrid's organization also has a lot of the younger members yeah. um, that Ingrid is leading uh, to champion for the rights of women. Um, and I'm personally very proud of the achievement of women's rights in Taiwan. And uh, not only do we have 41% uh, of female legislators, uh, we also, as you saw her this morning, a female president. So um, I want to uh, turn to Zhi Hao um, <clears throat> to ask about um, how, how um, uh, IORG uh, plan to engage the international community and your international partners. Because I know in the past few years, you've been uh, expanding IORG uh, to work with uh, civil societies overseas. So how do you think uh, you want to proceed with that? And what do you think IORG could contribute to the international civil society? Thank you, Kelly. Um, yes, we, we are a very small organization so far, um, but we try our best to talk to our international partners, um, experts, scholars, um, C CSOs. Um, in the process, I do find um, similar qualities here um, and then abroad is that we are, these NGOs, these uh, CSOs, we're all very persistent, right? We, uh, we, we believe in our values, we believe in our issues, and we, are, we won't stop until um, some changes are made, so until our countries are better. I think that we can all see in, in my colleagues sitting on, on the stage and also um, uh, listening to, to us speak. Um, we're all very resilient. Um, um, during our process talking with these NGOs, foreign and domestic, we find in, in face of difficult uh, situations, maybe dwindling of, uh, of civil society uh, ener energy, maybe the oppression from the government, or maybe foreign influences. Um, we are, we're still sticking um, to our guns, so to speak, um, to stick into our post and keep working um, on, our, on, our, on our issue, on our topic. Um, uh, through the process, I, think, I find one commonality that's pretty special is that uh, some of the organizations, we really do sort of make decisions and organize and govern, and, and govern ourselves uh, to, to, um, to the values that we, that we advocate, is that we practice the value that we want in our democracies ourselves before we ask others to do similar things, right? Um, in Taiwan, I think our, our, our democracy is very diverse. It's very plural, meaning that we have very different opinions sometimes. Um, but we all want something, we all want things that are uh, sort of universal. For example, we all want more transparency um, to, to when, when we speak to power. We all want more accountability, not only from corporations, from governments, 
on things like that. So I think as civil society actors, those are the values that um, we at RRG try to implement ourselves first. And we also see that sort of similar um, insistence in some of our partners and in, in, uh, that are outside of Taiwan that we're, we're, we're talking with, that we're working with. Um, I think that is something when IRG is dealing with information warfare, information operation, dealing with the very, very core issue of, of, of liberal democracies, that is freedom of speech, right? If we, want to, if we want to engage with more people, if we want to bring more people to the discussion to find out what are good conversations that we could have to preserve sort of to preserve democracy in all its diversity and all its plurality, but also to defend ourselves from bad influences, <laughs> from fake news, from problematic in information. I think that sort of level of transparency and accountability is, that w is something that we strive for, and we would uh, um, encourage our partners, um, we will share our experiences in trying to implement that with them, and then hopefully that our research and our efforts would once again make the internet, make the information environment <coughs> helpful to our democracy, not harmful, right? And this is something that we all grow up with, that we think the internet is helpful in bringing people together, and we, we try to do that um, in our work. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Zhihao. <coughs> And I know that the Taiwanese um, uh, organizations are uh, co-organizing workshop uh, during the assembly, so I, I really encourage you to speak to them. Uh, Zhihao's organization, um, um, they are able to find very interesting trends of uh, information warfare coming from authoritarian regimes, uh, especially under the COVID pandemic, and also during the Ukraine war um, and um, different major uh, international events. I want to turn to um, Sean. So um, <clears throat> you told us about the progress that we've made in Taiwan and um, the work that Hotline has done in the past two decades on furthering LGBTI rights. So <clears throat> what do you think that still needs to be done? And um, can you share with us the plans that uh, your organization is doing to achieve that? Thank you, Katie. Um, so many people think that uh, same-sex marriage is the ultimate goal for LGBTQI community. And since same-sex marriage was uh, legalized in Taiwan, so LGBTQI movement is finished in Taiwan. <laughs> of course, this is not true. Um, first, it is not for uh, marriage equality. So there are uh, still <laughs> several, several things, issues that need to be solved. So Taiwanese gays, or lesbians cannot get married with foreigners from countries that don't legalize same-sex marriages. And same-sex couples cannot co-adopt children, nor can they use artificial reproductive technologies in Taiwan legally. Yeah. So, um, and I just tell you about how important the Gender Equity Education Act is in Taiwan, but I think the implementation is still need to be improved. So there are not enough LGBTQI supportive resources like uh, friendly teachers and like curriculums in schools and not enough LGBTQI friendly measures in the workplace. So still uh, many employees in the workplace don't come out to others. And uh, transgender people among the LGBTQI community suffer the most. They still suffer from public ignorance and discrimination discriminalization in daily life and uh, in workplace and healthcare settings and still need to take gender reassignment surgery to change their sex in legal documents. These are the things that need to be done for LGBTQI community in Taiwan. And the obstacles we face, we are facing now is that the anti-LGBTQI organizations connect with other actually have connect and is connecting uh, with other conservative powers in Taiwan and from abroad. And they also learn from anti-LGBTQI narratives internationally. For example, the narratives that uh, transgender people will invade women's safe spaces. 
and they also use like a, a false in fake information try to attack uh, LGBTQ groups. And the anti-LGBTI <laughs> organizations also try to influence political, media, educational areas. This means that uh, we need more allies in all kinds of areas. And that is the things my organization and other LGBTQI groups are doing. We have groups like uh, KAPWR trying to provide adult education to seniors about family diversity. And we also have like uh, groups like Taiwan Equality Campaign try to connect with LGBTQI friendly legislators and city councillors. My organization also works on education for civil servants. So it is also important for us to have international allies. So I'm really happy to be here and hope <coughs> that we could meet each other and connect with each other more in the next three days and we can have more allies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adu. <coughs> um, I want to move on uh, to, to Yu Meng. Um, just a little bit of additional information about what Yu Meng mentioned um, about uh, the Ticket Home program that he uh, started in 2018. Um, it's because Taiwan does not have a mail-in voting system. And everyone who wants to vote in general elections have to travel back to their home cities and counties where their residency is, is uh, registered to vote. So this is why Yu Mo and his colleagues um, had uh, thought of this very interesting program to uh, encourage young people to purchase a ticket to go back home uh, to vote. So, um, and of course, Yu Mong is very busy right now, as he mentioned this morning, mm -hmm. uh, on the constitutional change of lowering voting age to 18. And mm -hmm. you also said this, this morning that in order to achieve that, there is a need of cross-generational support. So I want to ask you, um, these kind of dialogues sometimes can be difficult. Um, and how do you think, um, um, can you share with us the experience of uh, what you have with the older generation, the middle-aged generation, um, when it comes to convincing them that youth rights and human rights is something that they really need to uh, pay attention to. Um, share with us um, TYAD's experience in initiating these kind of dialogue and um, maybe some difficulties that you face. Uh, in the past, like in 2005, the NGOs has built up the another <coughs> alliance called Lowering the Voting Age. And now we have our 18-year-old Voting Age Alliance now. And uh, I think uh, more and more people join the alliance, join the issue. And there are uh, younger people join the alliance like high school students, like even senior school students. And what have they done uh, these days or these months? They've been to every uh, city and counties in Taiwan, like uh, in the southern part of Taiwan. We have a big city called Kaohsiung. And Kaohsiung has many students there. They try to go over uh, every place in Kaohsiung, like in the markets, like in uh, train stations, like uh, go to the uh, local place, like Li Zhang, the office of the uh, uh, principal yeah. of, of the, the town, hometown. And uh, I think their acts are very brave and very uh, creative that they try to persuade their grandma and grandpa and try to tell them uh, not to be uh, persuaded by uh, only by the uh, traditional media or only by the uh, information from the uh, internet, but they can really uh, talk together, discuss uh, the issue that uh, from the information they brought uh, from the campus or what they really think about. And uh, I'm, uh, what is very impressive is that uh, many students now all over Taiwan are doing this kind of activity. Like about uh, 500 students, uh, I know they are doing this kind of uh, uh, 
uh, this kind of act, and the uh, most uh, isolated island in Taiwan are called Jinmen, uh, and the Kaohsiung student, they because of this kind of activity, they been to Jinmen and they uh, built up a network with the uh, association from uh, Jinmen University, and they build up not only the cross-generation dialogue, but also I think the cross-islands dialogue. And I think this is a uh, very new and a uh, very creative way in Taiwan now because of our uh, amendment of our constitution. So I think uh, these four years we've talked about uh, many, uh, we've talked about very much on our constitution uh, amendment, but not only talk about, uh, not only try to persuade the uh, parliament, not only to uh, discuss with the uh, legislators, we try to uh, talk with the society. I think this is uh, the very uh, historic uh, moment for our students. So uh, now in Taiwan, all of the high school students uh, the Ministry of our Education uh, has been uh, regulated that all of the high school has has to build up the uh, high school student association so they can uh, discuss what their uh, <coughs> uniform styles are and they can discuss uh, whether the legislate uh, the regulation in school of the uh, haircut style or uh, when they their uh, classes about to start. I think this is mm -hmm. a very a progressive way to that the students, that the youngster to know that how can they uh, talk to uh, the adults and discuss all of the issues they care about with the society and try to build up the cross-generation uh, uh, students or even children like in Taiwan uh, we really care about CRC, so that we talk about CRC at school. At school, we try to tell the children, we try to tell the students what they, uh, what rights they have, so that them try to be not only a student but a citizen. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alvin. Um, I think I was really um, encouraged to see. Um, not only the, the, the um, Taiwanese administration, but also civil society is very actively promoting participatory democracy. That they really encourage, especially young people, to come together to, to discuss um, policies and things um, uh, that think things that are important to them. And also, uh, I think you have discussion over the school curriculum um, as well. Um, <clears throat> Yumeng's organization also. Um, did a very good project during the 2020 presidential election that they made appointments to all the presidential candidates to come speak at their association and present um, their policy platform regarding young people. And I was really happy to see that all three political candidates um, agreed to come to speak to the young people and share their youth platform with them. So I am assuming that you will do that again uh, in the upcoming uh, presidential and general election as well. So we have um, about five minutes left. Um, I was wondering if there's um, any questions from um, the participants uh, for Taiwanese NGOs here. That you're, you think that they're so impressive that you don't have questions for them. I can't really see because the lights are. Here's, sir. Um, oh, oh there, there's one over there, and then... Sorry, uh, yeah. okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Hold on. Okay, there's one back there, and then there's one. Here. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, <laughs> all okay, right. Yes, microphone. Hello, I'm, I'm Sean Shea, and I, I have a question. Um, you know, there's so much space to work in Taiwan. Uh, it's great to see that, but what's the, um, what's the biggest challenge you face working here? I'm just curious. Which, do you have any, uh, which? 
oh. one of our members are your director? Yeah, I guess um, any of them, you know, if they want to just take that question. Like, or, you know, what, what um, I'm just interested to see what you, what you see as the biggest challenge working as a NGO here okay. in Taiwan. I'll just say one thing is that um, uh, for us, one of the challenges are um, having competitive salaries for our for our for our researchers and for our educators, um, so that uh, people are willing and think that working at an NGO is a viable career path mm. for them. Mm. Um, I think that that would be something that. You, you see people are nodding here. <laughs> right, that, I think that, that is the one thing that I will add, yeah, to the conversation. Uh, thank you, my name is Hassan Shire. I'm from Kampala, Uganda, uh, from Divend Divenders, member of steering committee. I first of all congratulate you. This is my first time coming to Taipei and uh, Taiwan. Uh, and I came two days in advance to see and feel the bulls of democracy and openness of your country. They're very polite, very kind, elaborate, and organized community. Thank you so much. So the global community could learn something. Have you ever thought the best hope for you to remain a democratic nation is to make the threatening power in China also democratic. Because two democracies will never fight each other. If now, and I'm saying this properly, if Russia could have been remaining the path before Putin came to power, it could never have happened. Rush, democratic Russia could never have attacked Ukraine. So what efforts are you making, apart from focusing on your country, to make this country, which now become she bullet Buro, he become only himself and, and his image. Uh, what you want, how, how you are going to tackle that, to make them, to this idea, to take to them so that they will be at peace with you. Thank you. Which, which one of you wants to answer the question about making China democratic? Say, wait. I think, uh, thank you very uh, much for your questions. I think uh, lately uh, when we see the television and we see another uh, very, very dictative uh, dictators <laughs> uh, coming. And uh, I think uh, his decision is quite impulsive. You know, we never seen uh, in that big scene uh, a, a former uh, party leaders was escorted to, to take out. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, even in communist Chinese uh, uh, region, they never had this kind of thing happen. So uh, the, the impulsiveness really struck me. So I think it's, uh, it's quite, uh, for us, it's quite, um, we, we are so, so worried about this because the, if uh, this impulsiveness uh, uh, will uh, one day, uh, he has uh, uh, something uh, to, uh, you know, in his mind, and nobody can stop him. So I think the the different countries, especially the strong powers, should make uh, the balance uh, or uh, anything, uh, any major to to stop that. Because uh, in Taiwan, we really prepare ourselves, but uh, when the strong nation, you know like uh, Russia to attack uh, Ukraine, we also uh, the one who was suffered. So uh, I think we need to have a, a goal, you know, to have cooperation with each other in other uh, society, mm. other worlds. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. We're actually um, out of time, so um, 
Do you have anything else to add, Xiaodu and uh, or Alvin? Yeah, thank you, Katie. Uh, just I want to ask. I just want to add uh, some um, uh, information about uh, your question. And um, uh, actually, uh, LGBTQI issues um, is uh, was not are not supported by the China government. And um, um, so we are also worried about LGBTQI groups in China and in Hong Kong. And before, I think it's before 2018, we have a lot of opportunities to connect with uh, group LGBTQI groups in China and in Hong Kong, but uh, this opportunity just decreased mm. uh, dramatically in recent years. Yeah, and we are still trying to see like how we can help. Yeah, and hopefully we can find a way to try mm. to support more to our uh, allies in uh, China and Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, I hope um, you get uh, some information, the gist of what Taiwanese civil society is like and uh, the work that they have been doing and will be doing. Um, and for the next two days, uh, again, I, I, want to I, I want to say that you know, I really encourage you to speak to them and also um, our civil society colleagues uh, sitting in the audience. Um, I'm pretty sure that you will have a very productive discussion. So please join me to thank Ingrid, Zhao, Sean, and Alvin. And that's a wrap. Okay, everybody, I think we got a lot of food for thought this morning. Now it's time for food for stomach. Um, now, this afternoon, you'll be hearing different type of stories. Just now, we heard the story of open society, where you can actually engage in legislative advocacy. Civil society can freely engage with different actors. This, after lunch, you'll be hearing from story of Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Cuba, and we'll be hearing from uh, a member of parliament from Lithuania how the international community can support space like that. So I hope you can come back at two o'clock and we have begin the afternoon session. So I hope you enjoyed this morning session and see you in 90 minutes.